Hi, and welcome to Live at Kigali. I'm here with two amazing panelists to talk about technology and inclusion. The title of this uh, Live at Kigali session is Post Copy and Paste, Fostering Disruptive Innovation to Inclusion. We're looking to specifically talk about how technologies are invented and created in one part of the world and then pasted over and over in other parts of the world, regardless of cultural context. And so we're going to unpack those ideas. With me, to help me unpack these ideas, we have Nanjira Sambuli, who is a fellow uh, for Technology and International Affairs at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And we also have Arvind Gupta, who's the co-founder of Digital India Foundation. So I'm going to start with you, Nanjira. Um, you look into gendered impacts of ICT adoption on governance, media, entrepreneurship. Um, you also look to see how you can grow technology innovation and research. Um, what kind of emerging dynamics are you noticing in this space? Plenty dynamics. I think, for one, when to the theme of the session, the cut, copy, paste, a lot of what has happened as a natural outcome is the gendered impacts had often been an afterthought. So uh, clearly it was just a manifestation of the fact that it's probably a tech bro in a hoodie somewhere designing something that's supposed to suddenly have you know usefulness across the world. So there's been a lot of a focus on how does this impact um, women or people who are not men, I should put it that way. But at the same time, there's this risk of homogenizing women's experiences that is also challenging how we understand technology. And it's been really interesting to see the, how that complication has introduced a necessary chink, if you will, <laughs> into how people think about technology disruption innovation. And it's everything from the design of a particular technology. And here I think about the Apple Watch, for example, first launched with you know, innovative health outcomes did not think that half of the world would think about sexual and reproductive health as a use. And that was added on as an afterthought. So that was something that was called out pretty early on. Then you also have on the use side that a woman in Kenya or in Kigali or in Delhi will have a very different understanding of or experience around a technology um, than a woman in, say, Silicon Valley. And so on all these levels, there's still work to be done for people to understand that we are one, one half of the population of Earth, but at the same time, we're also not a homogenous group. So that's been a really interesting trend to see, which has led to this micro sort of in, innovations, um, and especially around sexual and reproductive health. Um, but it just speaks to the fact that people still either see women as a consumer group to just tap into, but not really to design fully for the depth and the complexities of experience that we actually have. It's an interesting tussle between the two, uh, but always having to keep calling it out and pointing out that these are not just neatly foldable you know, mm -hmm. categories has been a really interesting mm -hmm. trend to see over the last 20 years. Thank you for that. This is reminding me of a recent trip to Italy. I was in southern Italy in Bari, and the taxi driver was telling me that technology is bad and um, explained that he has somebody who he goes to buy pizza from. He says, the pizza man knows me, I know him, he knows exactly what I want. Why do I need an Uber Eats or someone in between me and the pizza guy that I go to all the time? And he was concerned about how these technologies, which were copy pasted, um, were threatening the social cohesion that he has in his community. So I wanna turn to you, Arvind Gupta. For an example, um, we, we kind of spoke about something similar. These, are, these examples are things people don't think about, which is why we need to bring these examples to life. And so I will um, ask you to talk a little bit about technology inclusion, what that looks like, but first give us an example of something that we wouldn't anticipate having a cultural implication. So for, let me start with uh, saying that, you know, having worked and lived in Silicon Valley, um, the global north, um, as, as some people call it, um, you know, uh, there's a deep appreciation of technology there, but not diversity and cultures. And I think um, the Silicon Valley really innovates for the top one billion of the world. But there are much more than that that live across the world. And um, Africa, India, Asia, Europe, your taxi driver, uh, you know, all of this uh, is not something that is taken into consideration. And I, and I say from my personal experience, um, when, when the designers, the, the architects, are working on a product in Silicon Valley. So that's, that's the shame. The technology they built is pretty good, 
you know, whether it solves a lot of problems, probably not. Coming to an example, and that, and that examples will say it all, because, uh, you know, you, you look at now ways, and COVID has also seen this. I mean, I use a small robotic cleaner in my room. It doesn't work in India. It works fanta uh, fantastically well uh, in the U.S. My friends in the U.S. use it all the time. I thought I'll copy and paste it in, into India, into my room, and it doesn't work because our eating habits are different. We eat on the floor sometimes. There is, there is difference in the way our, our homes are made. I mean, if you take it to Japan, they probably uh, will be even different than or Africa, it will be different. So that, that robotic cleaner that works so well and so efficient in, 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 a, in a Western world is not going to be the same because it's going to you know, probably eat into the banana leaf plates that we have uh, that are actually part of our uh, culture to eat food. So. Uh, the, the limited point I think we are making is a copy and paste innovation. There was an era that it was funded and supported by two big sectors. One is the companies of Silicon Valley because they wanted to go all across the world. The markets were big. And two, by the venture capitalists because they understood that. They said, hey, you know, are you doing the same? You know, we, we've seen X company do successfully well in, in, the, in, the, in the west coast of U.S., don't have to apply too many brains. Just take it, copy and paste it. It will work in your country and we'll give you 100 million to do it. So those two sectors and maybe more, you know, created a culture which was copy and paste. But uh, fortunately for the world, now we have many models evolving which are going beyond this copy and paste, which are bottom-up models, not this one billion down model. The bottom-up model is, is a consumer who probably spends $2 or $3 a month at most on the internet connection, earns a dollar a, a day maybe. You know, uh, we're sitting here in Kigali. The GDP here, the per capita here is about uh, $3 a day, um, I've been told. Uh, that's, that is the audience that we are talking to. And for that audience, to design for that audience, you need a fresh thinking. You need a bottom-up thinking, not a top-down thinking. And, and I can, you know, um, I can give you one example. Uh, and that comes from my country, India. We have 23 different languages. We have a lot of diversity, income levels, educational differences, age differences. And one of the things we did is that when we make technology today, it has to, it has to service a population scale of a billion. So there's a lot of diversity already. Mm -hmm. Service all languages, all literacy levels, and all income levels. So my uh, simple platform, identity platform, or a payments platform will work on a smartphone, on a voice phone, on a, on a non-smartphone, and on an assisted mode where you can walk in and do the same transaction. So um, the, the, it's a very different model. And, and the, dev, the, the outcomes of that are much more pleasing than, uh, than serving a billion people. And perhaps that model that you are describing in India does not need to be exported anywhere mm -hmm. else. So there's this kind of um, underlying expectation that what you're doing is meant to scale and meant to scale globally across cultures, languages, and religions. So um, since we've kind of uh, unpacked that a bit, could you then, both of you, um, give us some kind of key takeaways about what are the elements of technological inclusion? What does that look like? What does that mean? So to our audience who says, okay, I'm I, I want to be digitally inclusive, technologically inclusive. I care about women. I care about different cultures. How do I do that? What does that look like? And we'll start with uh, Nanjira. Can, yeah, I, can I, I just quickly come in on one point? You said it doesn't need to be exported. Well, yes, it doesn't need to be exported, but it needs to be learned from. Mm. Because the problems of Africa, the problems of India, the problems of rest of Asia are similar. So that's the only thing I want to take, that our problems are similar. Mm -hmm. We want societal technology. We don't want a technology that serves a purpose of the few and the rich. Right. And that's the only difference. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go Thank ahead. You. No, I agree completely, because I was going to say one of the core principles for digital development in the development sector, to your sectors actually, is scale. And the obsession with scale as cut, copy, and paste, really as opposed to redesigning and rethinking that, which absolutely uh, appends what we have as a model today, where skill, rather than being, it worked in India, it will work in Africa, whatever your imagination of Africa is, a country, 54 countries, is how about what is sustainable in Rwanda? 
what is sustainable next door? And then scale is the interoperability of what is sustainable to the different ecosystems. If that were to hold as a model that design, uh, to design for inclusion, the challenge is it actually challenges the model, the VC model, the development sector model too, that says, okay, it worked in India, or I'm from Kenya, where M-Pesa as a financial system is this lauded success, but those who ran off to try and launch it in South Africa and elsewhere found those are different markets. Yes, we're all Africans, but we have very different points of arrival to the financial system. But now even with M-Pesa as a success story in Africa, they're learning that in every country they go into, you have to understand the modalities. You have to understand who the user is. You have to understand what the perspective is. Where are the pain points with accessing finance, moving their money, what are their core concerns, and then use that. To which I would only add, also those who are designing the technology need to get off whatever pedestal, real or imagined, that they're the ones who know it all. That changes the model uh, completely. You come in with humility and you observe and say, am I able in a position to use something or build something that might help? I really like the India model and I like that it's actually national policy where if you're going to design from everything from a smartphone to the analog and back is really important because this notion that the technology is the end all and be all is really leading us to a place where we are actually accelerating and exacerbating inequalities. Because now the cost of inclusion becomes I must have a smartphone to access financial services or this, that, or the other. Um, and if we could just uh, pull that thread a bit, the reason why this is important is because there's some people of a different generation, not necessarily people who don't have access to these devices, but they just are not aware how to use them. Literacy. And so they're, they're left out because of digital literacy. In fact, Yesterday, August 9th, my country, Kenya, has an election. One of the countries uh, in the global south who are importing global north election technology to run the elections. It turned out that people who've been voting since independence suddenly couldn't have their, bio, their biometric fingerprints identified. And therefore, they were cast away. They were told to go home. People who've been voting since 1963 could not vote yesterday. To that very point you're making there. And I know that India has had similar models with the Aadhaar system where those were the little things that were not understood. There are some ablest um, in, uh, an, a, an intended consequences to these things. But if you're not designing any technology that has been imported from free, somewhere in the West to come and run your election that hasn't had that consideration in mind, you end up compounding inequalities and exclusions. So that even before we talk about cool, nice principles for inclusion, just do not exclude first might be the first principle, and then we build from there. And this is something that you can see that happens in a country without going to another country. People t t sometimes just forget the digital literacy that exists in their own country. And what would you say, Arvind? So first of all, the, the example that Nanjira gives is so, so important because, you know, um, when we set out, for example, the identity platform, the Aadhaar, that she talked about, we had the fingerprints, we had the iris scans. The fingerprints do become bad. The devices do become bad over time. So you, you, we had to set up processes, and 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 I'm not saying we were we we set them correct on day one, but you know we would recognize that we have to change. We have to be very agile in our systems, and and that's another that's a point to uh, you know what you were making. How do you trust technology? How do you, what do you take away from this session? Is that you, the consumers, the citizens, the users have to start trusting technology. And the trust in technology happens when they know they've stood in a queue, it didn't work that day, and we told them, give us a week, we'll fix the process, they come back the next week and again do the same process in the, in the in same technology, same transaction in a different process. And, and that is a trust that you have to have. And, and, and we have to learn. And they have to have the trust in the, in the government, in the systems that, you know, if we give feedback, this will come back and they will come back and solve it. Because there is, I mean, you know, all of you, I, I'm a techie, as I said, I can, I can tell you there is no software that started with one and ended with one. I mean, it's, it keeps <laughs> developing. I mean, we, we use version X of maybe 100X of Microsoft or Apple or something else. So, I think we all, when we build large scale platforms which have societal impact, we need to keep the point that Nanjira is keeping in mind, what I'm saying. It needs to be nimble enough, it needs to be agile enough, it needs to be, you know, it needs to be inclusive mm -hmm. and that it should not exclude, but there will be changes that will be required and you need to keep changing them very fast in a very agile manner. Um, the a aspect of trust to me is the biggest thing. Mm. 
And the aspect of trust comes with fairness, comes with uh, ag agility, comes with transparency, comes with, you know, um, a, with people who understand ethics and diversity. So I think trust is a very, very big thing. But if I have to take one thing away from technology, I think what, which will be a de defining factor as we go, you know, go in the future, mm -hmm. is going to be trust in technology. And if that's the case, I would add, then, then we need education. Because technology is moving very fast. There's an entrepreneur I follow, Peter Diamandis. He says that in the next 10 years, in this decade, we will experience the equivalent of the amount of technological change in the past 100 years, but in 10 years. And you can already start to see how things are moving fast with augmented reality, um, with smart cities and all of that. So as we kind of conclude this talk, let's look to the future and um, end on some concluding thoughts of the future. Our future, what we're looking at is we're looking at um, the, that smaller people can have a bigger voice um, through different platforms, um, can have greater reaches. That could be bound, though, by algorithms. Blockchain could potentially um, allow for greater usability for different people. However, let's think about smart cities and our mediated lives through algorithms. <laughs> What are, and I'm not going to restrain or, or, or um, kind of caveat this, just your, your open-ended thoughts on what you would like people to think about as we look to this future of um, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, DNA editing, where we look to see uh, how artificial intelligence is going to help us understand cancer better. There's so much good promise here. And so how do we balance this where there is inclusion, there is equity, there is education, there is awareness? So uh, this time I will start with Arvind. Uh, well, I think, uh, as I said, I continue the number one aspect that there has to be trust on both the sides, uh, both the consumer side of technology and the makers of technology. So mm -hmm. trust is a very mutual thing. Secondly, I think, you know, I'm going to make a very um, motherhood statement that you know, what errors or what mistakes we've made in the web 1.0 mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, and really exfoliated those things, made it completely the, the internet 2.0 or the web 2.0 was an advertising led model, uh, which few companies control. I think the future, the web 3.0 is all about um, trust, equity, um, uh, you know, decentralization, democratization of what the internet actually imagined uh, way back in the early, uh, late 80s, early 90s. So, um, and to come to that, um, I don't want algorithms to tell me how I should consume, what should I watch and what should I not watch? Mm -hmm. What news should I do? I don't want them to alter my, my brain, my mindset. Mm -hmm. I want to be more free to choose. And that is the democratization of, of Web 3.0 that I think whether it comes from X technology, blockchain, or Y technology, that we'll wait and see. But as an intent, uh, a trusted, decentralized, democratized system is what will be required. Thank you, Nanji. I was going to pick up on education, and you teed it up so beautifully, because I was worried about education and some of these social goods being mediated through technology. So you end up with somebody's whole worldview or literacy, however you want to define it, being defined by these technologically mediated and transparent mechanisms. I'm less worried about where we're headed based on the technology. We know the proof of concept is there. It is the intricacies of human interactions yes. that will make or break all these promises. And we have to go from this dichotomy of hype and doom and realize we are complex. These are historical and sort of like Anthropocene issues meeting through technologies that are being designed today but with the histories of the past. I'm actually very much less worried about algorithms working ones and zeros. I'm also a mathematician, so on that part, we know. It is who is designing the one and zero to what end? That's right. Are they trying to get one up over me or vice versa? That is what will actually ultimately determine whether all these technologies just create the next big bang or we actually get to a place where we've been striving towards humanity with all these, mm -hmm. you know, nice sounding principles to arrive at them. And I'll conclude by saying actually because around education and literacy, we must also not assume that people are sitting somewhere waiting for you to come and educate them. They are experts of their lived experiences. Mm -hmm. So if we start designing anything that you want to improve their lives based on that, even our own concept of education will change fundamentally. Mm -hmm. Because just 50 years ago, my ancestors were being told they know nothing mm -hmm. in these lands, right? 
but they had their own knowledge that is not informing how we're shaping technologies today because it was suppressed. So those are the things that if we don't get right in this decade, then we could really open up that chimera of inequalities and injustice. And then, you know, um, we'll be in history however we are written down. <laughs> That's a, a wonderful end to this discussion. So I think if we sum it up, it's trust and um, really recognizing that we are multifaceted in our cultures, in our individuality and all of that, and technology needs to respect that. Um, for those who are watching, the hashtag is uh, hashtag KGD22, and we look forward to seeing your thoughts on social media. Thank you. Thank you.